definitely as everyone is still joining i can see that people are joining 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 as i speak and we welcome you to uh, our third part of our conversation about dancing in the darkness spiritual lessons uh, for thriving in turbulent times and Dr. Brenda, it's good to see you. Glad that you are with us. Is it? Oh, you're on mute. On mute. Good to see you as well. Happy to be here. Good well, evening, everyone. Well, we're delighted that everyone there is still coming in. Uh, so we'll just give a few moments. Well, why don't we have a word of prayer and we can get started? Okay. Lord, we are grateful and we are thankful uh, for your love, uh, for your power, for your grace, uh, for your tender hand that directs and guides us and disciplines us as we approach uh, your word and this study once again, uh, we are just grateful for the connection uh, between uh, the Bay Area and uh, the city of Big Shoulders, known as Chicago, uh, the connection between Trinity United Church of Christ and Allen Temple Baptist Church. Uh, we're grateful for two congregations uh, that are filled with people who arrive to uh, the respective cities through the Great Migration. And we are just thankful for all of the myriad of stories uh, that rest in each pew. So may your blessing be upon us, uh, that we may discover something new about you, or have a revelation of how you are operating in our lives. Uh, we thank you and we love you. And in the mighty and wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 I first, as always, want to say thank you to the Allen family, uh, to the Allen Temple Baptist Church. Uh, along with uh, your magnificent pastor, uh, Reverend Jacqueline Thompson, uh, just an absolute gift. Uh, she preached for us for our seven last words uh, during uh, COVID. It was uh, pre-recorded, and she did such an amazing job. Uh, we need to have Pastor Thompson in person, and it would be wonderful to have the Allen family uh, when when pastor comes. And so I'm I'm offering that invitation. I would like to continue to keep uh, this connection between our congregations and the 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 work of Allen Temple. It goes without saying you have had an incredible impact across the globe and, and we are beneficiaries of of the work and the witness that Allen Temple has provided uh, over over the years. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that uh, invitation. We would love to come and join you. Well, we 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 like people to make that happen. <laughs> let's let's make let's make that happen. Chicago is a good place to hang out. Uh -huh. and, uh, if you all come in the summer, uh, you can come. We'll work out so you can see a WNBA game. Since we now have Angel Reese. Angel Reese <laughs> is the Chicago sky. I just gotta just gotta give that up. LSU. We got LSU and we've got the University of South Carolina Center now is also a part of, of the Chicago Skies. So we have uh, two of the top NBA rookie wow. teams are in Chicago. So mm -hmm. maybe we have to work this out during the summertime so you all can uh, you get, a, get a WNBA game and uh, you can come hang out uh, with, uh, with Trinity United Church of Christ. Yeah. Well, I want to do something uh, tonight a little bit different. I'm going to make uh, some book recommendations. These are these are poems. These are books of poetry because I want to open up with a a poem from a young poet who I have just been fascinated by, a gentleman by the name of Rudy Francesco. I think he is actually from. The Bay Area, if I'm if I'm not or used to live in the Bay Area, maybe it was uh, at one point, uh, but from his book Helium and this simple poem, I think, is very important for our conversation uh, tonight, as we'll be talking a little bit about beating bias uh, as we move into also talking about um, your origin story and rewriting your origin story. This poem is entitled. Windows and Mirrors 
by Rudy Francesco. It's very short, but I think it is very apropos and powerful. There was a moment in my life when I couldn't tell the difference between a window and a mirror. I could look into both and see everything but myself. Windows and Mirrors by Rudy Francesco. I could see everything but myself. Rudy Francesco does a beautiful job uh, communicating this idea of the necessity of self-reflection. What happens when we are unable uh, to look into the mirror and make a critique of ourselves uh, and look into the window and see the possibilities that we all carry, windows and, and mirrors. And so tonight, I want to have a conversation uh, and draw from uh, the chapter in the book about beating bias. It's one of the shorter chapters, uh, but it was really a personal reflection about uh, something that happened in, in, in my life, specifically at Trinity United Church of Christ. Uh, beating bias. This is one of the principles, the principle of self-reflection that is necessary for us to thrive as human beings, but also for us to uh, deepen our relationship uh, with, with God. So I'll begin with the story uh, in this way. We do something at Trinity United Church of Christ every February. Let me put it this way. There are, there are holy moments in the life of the church. Normally, we talk about Advent, which leads us up to Christmas, and we talk about uh, Easter, Lent, that leads us up to, to resurrection. In some traditions, uh, there is an elevation of Pentecost. Uh, in, in other traditions, uh, there are other moments throughout the liturgical calendar. For Trinity, uh, there is, and especially in Black churches, there's Christmas, uh, there's Mother's Day, and there's Easter. For Trinity, there's Christmas, there's Mother's Day, there's Easter, and there's Black History Month. Black History Month for us is a high, holy time. We have an experience called Ma'afa. Ma'afa, it is, an, it is a Swahili word, M-A-A-F-A, -A, that means disaster or tragedy. We had the experience as a church to experience the production of the Ma'afa by the St. Paul Community Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York, at the time that was pastored uh, by Reverend Dr. Johnny Youngblood. And it was a, a, a play of sorts uh, that showed the experience of people of African descent uh, from that time period of what was considered the great tragedy, the transatlantic slave trade to their arrival in the United States. We were inspired by that, and we created the liturgical ma'afa. The liturgical ma'afa was simply this, that each Sunday during Black History Month, during February, first, second, third, and fourth Sunday, would be a unique emphasis of African American and African history. First Sunday, uh, was an emphasis on, on African and West African history. Our music would be West African and West African influenced. And our drama ministry would create a living museum. So after service, there was a living museum of people who were embodying the characters from our history. Uh, they would be simply like people like Mansa Musa, the, the wealthiest human being to, to, to ever live, or Queen Nzinga, uh, the great leader and warrior, and so on and so on. Each Sunday would be different. First Sunday would be, would be West African. The uh, second Sunday would take us to the Caribbean, since most uh, people of African descent, you do know that we did not land in the U.S. immediately, there was a stop, and that stop was the Caribbean. So the second Sunday, we might be in Cuba, or Puerto Rico, or Haiti, and guess what? The liturgy would shift, and the music would, would shift on those Sundays. So if we were in Cuba, guess what? Someone would read the scripture in English and in Spanish. 
on on that second Sunday. We would have music that was praise, worship music, hymns that were what? They were Afro-Cuban in origin, or it was Creole French if we were focusing on characters and the history of Haiti and Toussaint Overture and all of that. So that was the second Sunday. Uh, and then the third Sunday, uh, you would have uh, what we would know as the landing in the U.S. And many times we'd love to land in um, in, in Louisiana uh, just so that we could, the focus of the music would be jazz. Uh, so we would focus in on that. And then we would deal with the American experience. And then the fourth Sunday, Great Migration, where we are then moving toward Chicago. And so over the years, uh, we mixed it up in a variety of different ways. And one particular year, we wanted to elevate uh, people of African descent who had who broke barriers in terms of, of sports. It was, one, it, was one of the, it was one of the years that we wanted to focus in on that. And we have a worship team that puts together and assists in worship. It's a team of men and women, uh, young, uh, and those who are elders and people who are in music, who are dance, just all different people, people that are in our, our, our media team, uh, the people who are behind the camera, who are doing the live stream. All, you have all these wonderful different voices who can give you from different perspectives. For, for whatever reason, uh, this particular time, uh, the person who was leading the worship team um, chaplain uh, Janae at the time was not not with us at that time. And then several of the other sisters who were also present were not there for whatever reason. And there we were. The, the committee was now all male. The committee was now all male. And we were excited about lifting up uh, certain uh, athletic figures. And of course, the committee was all male uh, sitting there. And we were excited about people we were excited about. You know, one person's like, oh, man, we got to have Muhammad Ali on the cover of the bulletin. And then, you know, someone else is mentioning Joe Lewis. And then someone's talking about Jack Johnson. You know, there was just all these people just lifting up and they're mostly male figures. And so the bulletin was printed again because the full committee was not there. And then Sunday came along and we had a, we had a good worship service. And then we always the next week, the worship team goes through worship to talk about what happened, what worked, any things that we need to improve on. Uh, the computer was down or the sound wasn't right, whatever it may be. And the whole committee was there. And it was Chaplain Janae Colvin uh, who said, yeah, worship was, was good. The only problem I had is when I looked at the bulletin. I looked at the bulletin and I saw nothing but brothers. I said, we didn't see the WNBA. They're the ones who stood up in reference to Black Lives Matter, not the NBA. It was the WNBA was the first to get on board. And at that moment, I realized what had happened in that particular moment when you had all men on the committee at that moment. Then we ended up because we were looking through a window and a mirror and we couldn't see, we could see everything but ourselves. We had a particular uh, challenge at that moment that we missed out on all of these sisters who were, uh, who, were who should have been presented on, in the bulletin. And so the next week we, we changed that uh, and then featured all these incredible sisters who had made, who broke barriers uh, athletically uh, from the Althea Gibsons to the, uh, the Williams sisters, uh, to Flo Joe, to the WNBA, so on and so on and so on. And then people who were behind the scenes, uh, people who, who had been negotiating contracts and uh, who had started businesses and who were agents and all, you know, all of these things. Uh, but it began because we had in the room, people who were willing to say that our voices were not represented. And that was an important moment to understand. And it helped me understand the idea of beating bias 
is also connected to this idea of liberation and listening. Uh, to know that it is not possible, uh, no matter how well-read someone is, no matter how many places that you have traveled, uh, that as human beings, we see through a glass darkly. As human beings, we only see a portion of. And that is the beauty of ensuring that you have a mosaic of people uh, who are building and developing when it comes to any type of, of work. And if we are in this present moment in America, we have a pushback, pushback. You hear all of this stuff about DEI. DEI has become the new N-word for some people uh, of saying essentially uh, that is one conservative, as I've looked put it that way, said, oh, it doesn't mean you earned it. Uh, but yet uh, you have a push in America where you have individuals and organizations that are so fearful for the expansion and the inclusion and seeing the full picture of American history. The number one book being um, written off of book lists for students in America is Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. The number one book. Number two is Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. The fear of, of seeing the full expanse. The fear of knowing all of American history. The fear of knowing that you are not the center of the universe, the fear. And so if we are to see a transformative moment happen in our community, and in the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, the yet to be United States of America, we have to beat bias. We have to have liberation listening and recognize that we do not have all of the answers. Let, let me give a, a, another story uh, that, that, that uh, may resonate with some of you. Uh, there is the, uh, the wonderful and uh, um, amazing uh, story of uh, the Montgomery Improvement Association, better known as the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Uh, if I may give two pieces of history to connect uh, this story, I'm sorry, I'm a preacher, and so I traffic in stories. So let me tell you a story first about a gentleman by the name of Vernon Johns, who was born in Lynchburg, uh, Virginia. Uh, Vernon Johns only went to school three to four months of the year. And many people who are on this uh, webinar know that people of African descent, especially in the 20s, 30s and 40s, there was no expectation that you would move beyond what was called the seventh or eighth grade. Your job was to pick cotton if you were in the South. And to be able to move beyond that was in itself uh, a miracle, a miracle of resistance and resilience. But Vernon Johns, he knew, knew that he had been called by God, not just as a preacher, but as a thinker as a scholar. And he had dreams to go to Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. And so he prepared his, uh, his, uh, his, his resume and his application to go to Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio. Now, he knew that he didn't have all the necessary credits, but he knew he was smarter than anybody at Oberlin College. He, he knew that. You know, he had a beautiful sense of Black confidence uh, that had been instilled in him by his parents and his church. It is Howard Thurman who puts it this way. He said, when Black people understood that they were loved by God and they loved themselves, then a revolution would always happen. When you know those two things, it changes who you are because it changes the story that other people say about you. So Vernon Johns, and I heard this story first uh, from, from my father, 
Uh, and it's also, you can find pieces of it in a book entitled uh, Parting the Waters, which is the story, probably one of the best uh, books on the civil rights movement by a scholar by the name of Taylor Branch. It has three parts to it. It is the most extensive study on the freedom movement in America. Vernon Johns uh, knew that, uh, since he didn't have the necessary credits, and uh, that they might turn him down. Uh, they may deny him. But he said, you know what, they're going to deny me to my face. So he mailed his, uh, his application in uh, and then got on a train, making sure that he would arrive the same day his application arrived at Oberlin. He said, if they're going to deny me, they're going to deny me to my face. And so when he arrived on the campus of Oberlin, he went directly to the dean's office and said to the dean, he said, Dean, my name is Vernon Johns and I am here to start my classes. This dean was overwhelmed because you got to understand this is 19, this is 1930s, I believe, uh, might have been the late 20s. And he's, he's kind of shocked that here's this, this black boy from Lynchburg, Virginia, just showing up in his office. So he's moving papers around on his desk and then he finds Vernon Johns application and says, uh, uh, Vernon? I have your application here. We were planning to deny you because you don't have the credits to get into Oberlin. And then Vernon Johns, without skipping a beat, said, well, sir, do you want brains or do you want credits? I got all the brains and I may not have the credits. And the dean was a little bit upset and annoyed that this black boy was talking to him in this manner. And he says, boy, you, you, you got to be able to read Greek fluently if you want to come to Oberlin College. And then Vernon John scanned the bookshelf, just like a bookshelf behind me, he said, sir, is that a Greek book behind you? May I have it, please? He takes the Greek book, he reads it fluently, hands it back to the dean and said, again, I say, sir, do you want brains or do you want credits? I've got the brains, I may not have the credits. The dean thought it was a trick. And he said, now, well, you, you, you got to also read Hebrew. He said, dean, I see you got to Hebrew book right back there, over there. Could, could I have that, please? He reads that fluently, hands it back to him. And he said, I say again, do you want brains or do you want credits? They allow him to enter into Oberlin and he graduates second in his class, salutatorian. From there, he is called to a small church in Montgomery, Alabama. But because he was such a radical a black liberation preacher before the word li black liberation had even been formed, this idea. He would preach amazing sermons every Sunday that would push the envelope in Alabama. I'm about to give you the names of two of his sermons. One sermon was entitled, Is Heaven Segregated? The other one was, is it legal to lynch Negroes in Alabama? He put it out on the marquee. Is it legal to lynch Negroes in Alabama? For the sermon he was going to preach of an upcoming Sunday, the sheriff drove by the church, witnessed what he was going to preach, went to his house and arrested him for a sermon that he hadn't preached. Now, you got to be a bad preacher to be arrested for a sermon you're going to preach. So they bring him down to the jail and with all of the deputies around him, uh, with guns on their hips, the sheriff says, now Vernon, you need to tell us what you gonna preach on Sunday. And Vernon Johns, again, looking around and seeing that all these white men with guns on their hips, he then takes his hat in his hand, puts it on his chest, and he says to them, sir, I'd be happy to tell you what I'm gonna preach on Sunday. But since I am a Baptist preacher, he puts his hat out. He said, I first must take an offering from everybody. And of course, they started laughing at that moment. And he gets out of that, that predicament. But he doesn't stop. He continues every Sunday. And most of his church was, they were, quote, middle class. He stood one Sunday and, and told all of the bourgeois folk, he said, I say to all of you today, if you want to see a case of perpetual motion, have a Negro park his Cadillac on land that he owns. He was always critiquing the bourgeois class and saying we must own and operate and live differently so that we control 
all in our community. And I mean, he was just pushing, pushing the envelope consistently. So eventually the deacons got rid of him. They said, we, we're just tired. You're too radical. We're putting you out. And so they pushed him out of the church. And the deacons had a meeting and said, never again will we have a radical preacher. Never again will we have anybody that will preach radical sermons. We want someone young and someone we can control. And then one of the preachers says, I know of a young man uh, who just finished getting his PhD up in Boston. And they all voted at that moment and called Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to be the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And so that then becomes, he becomes the precursor of what Dr. King would eventually do. Dr. King arrives in Montgomery, Alabama, young man, 26, PhD, uh, but yet he is in this space he'd never been to this middle-class church uh, that had had a previous minister who was uh, this radical firebrand. And something happens not long after he had arrived. A woman by the name of Rosa Parks was arrested. Now, please understand this, that when Rosa Parks was arrested, she was not the first to be arrested in Montgomery, Alabama for sitting on a bus. It was another woman by the name of Claudette Colvin, who was the one who sat down. The only reason most people do not know Claudette Colvin's name is because the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund would not take up the case because of this. They were afraid because Claudette Colvin was not married and had a child that it wouldn't look good to have a Negro woman who was a single mother to be the face of this action to break Jim Crow. So Rosa Parks sits and she's not meek and mild. Rosa Parks had been an organizer for years. As a matter of fact, it is in one particular book that it talks about that Rosa Parks many times used to carry a little pistol in her purse. And she said that if I'm not around, if there's a brother not to protect me, said I know how to handle myself and handle myself with what's in my purse. <laughs> Rosa Parks was not meek and mild. She was an organizer and could not stand Jim Crow. And so now she is arrested and there's a meeting, I believe it was at Holt Street Baptist Church, might've been uh, the church at the time, where the leadership, the leadership in AACP, uh, the local organizers of the city at the time, um, and uh, most of the men were in the front kind of arguing, and there was a group of sisters who were kind of sitting back, kind of looking at the men kind of cockeyed. Uh, and the men were, some of the men were saying, well, let's have a, 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 a just the, have the NAACP uh, to, 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 to take this case. And another person was saying, well, let's just uh, boycott for a day. They're just going back and forth arguing, you know, about boycott for a day, give it to the NAACP. Uh, no one was talking about having a creating a major movement. They're really talking about turning it over to some other organization. Dr. King was just sitting there. He was just there in the meeting. He wasn't really weighing in whatsoever. He's brand new. He didn't know anybody. But in the back, group of sisters, the woman by the name of Joanne Robinson was in the back. Many people have never heard of Joanne Robinson. Joanne Robinson, who was a major organizer, she ran the Women's Political Council and taught at Alabama State University. While all the men were arguing. Joanne Robinson got the rest of the sisters says, come on, these brothers are going to be arguing all night. Let's, let's get on out of here and go over to Alabama State and organize. We're going to start a movement. We're going to boycott until we get what we deserve. And so the women went over to Alabama State and they were going to put together flyers to inform the entire black community that we are going to boycott now until in Montgomery, Alabama, until dignity is restored to the people of this community. Every Negro can live in dignity. And they were going to they created flyers and they were going to use a mimeograph machine to print 55,000 flyers and send them out to every black family in Montgomery. Now, for those of you who know anything about a mimeograph machine, <laughs> mimeograph machine, they don't, they, don't, they don't function like copy machines. They don't function like anything like we have today. You have to crank those things out. 
And so they had cranked out a, a few thousand, but they were a long way from 55,000. But they had recruited, they had recruited paper boys to be their distributors of the flyers to say, we are boycotting the buses of Montgomery. They gave one group of flyers to a paper boy. The paper boy is on his way to deliver and something happens, a gust of wind, it just been the hand of God, blows the flyers all over the place. One of the flyers lands on the car of an individual who was a part of the White Citizens Council. That was supposed to be the respectable Ku Klux Klan, the respectable KKK. He gets the flyer and is shocked that Negroes would think that they could get out of their place and they would boycott in Montgomery. So he takes the flyer to the head of the, uh, the uh, White Citizens Council, who was also the publisher of the Montgomery newspaper. And he gives it to him, says to him, he said, look what these Negroes are trying to do. These, they're, they become uppity. We got we to let all the white people know that the Negroes are being uppity. We got to put them in their place. So the publisher of the paper decides he's going to let all the white people know. And he takes a full page ad and puts the flyer as the full page ad in the Montgomery newspaper not realizing that he informs all of the white people, he informs every black person in all of Montgomery at the same time. So Dr. King wakes up the next morning and finds out that he had not only been voted as head of the Montgomery Improvement Association, but now he is leading a boycott in the city because of Joanne Robinson and the women who organized at the Alabama State University. That is why we have what we know as the Montgomery bus boycott to today. The men were in the room, but it was the sisters who did the work and the organizing. And there wouldn't be a movement if it hadn't been for them. Sometimes we can look into a mirror and a window and see everything but ourselves. And so this is what it means when we talk about beating bias, that we have to learn how to listen and raise the question who's not in the room, whose voice is not being given. Uh, who do we also need to consult? How do we, we got to begin to have the sensitivity to recognize uh, those who have been excluded. And in this nation, in America in this moment, we have a deep difficulty in reference to this. We are fearful because the story that we tell, the stories that we share, they will either liberate us or they will enslave us. One of the most powerful things is for someone to give you a new story. Hold up, let me back up, let me break it down because everybody here is a person who connects with this brother I love named Jesus. I like Jesus, he's my man, love Jesus. I mean, he really is my man. And the story that we have in relationship with you is a new story, a story that changes us. And in America, every time there has been a social movement, a movement of social justice, think about it. It's a, it's a movement to change the story. Abolition is a movement to change the story from you are only three-fifths of a person to you are God's child. The suffrage movement is a new story, a new story that changes from only certain people are given the right based on their gender to vote to everybody, from marginalized to child of God. The labor movement is a new story every time there is a movement of social justice. It is an idea of expanding is a new story. And there is always a pushback 
from those who want to keep the old story. This is what Confederate monuments are about. How do we keep an old story alive so that we do not have to deal with the power shift that may take place if we get rid of these monuments? And if I just may just stop on a tangent there, it's fa rather fascinating to me that in America, we have monuments to traitors. We have monuments of men who led an insurrection and who lost the war. I mean, just, I mean no other country it has, does this. Who does this? You can't go to Germany and see anything for the Third Reich. They don't have any monuments to, to the Third Reich and SS and Hitler. They lost. <laughs> they lost. And guess what? In countries where there has been independence, you don't have monuments in Ghana celebrating colonialism. You don't have monuments in Senegal celebrating, oh, at once, you know, we were a French colony and these people enslaved us. Let's build a few statues for them. No, they take them down and put up new statues to say we've got a different story. And what they do is they put those images where they belong in a museum to tell the story, the full story of how we have expanded and now more people are included. My understanding of stories, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna pull, I'm gonna pull this book off here. I'll probably see this one back here. Uh, there's one thing I've always loved, it's comic books ever since I was little. This particular comic book is called Bitter Root. It's a black comic book. I love black comic books. I go to Comic-Con. I'm even writing a comic book right now. Um, and ever since I was, was young, and when I found out some of the origin or what is called an origin story, uh, of comics and, and comic writers. The origin story for every hero is you've got to find out that that hero is usually on a journey. And when they discover whether it is their power or who they are, it changes who they are com completely. Um, if you're talking about uh, the person, if for people may, who may be more familiar with some things, if you're talking about a, a Black Panther, when he discovers and understands uh, his true connection of who he is uh, and his lineage and understands that uh, lineage and comes to accept that lineage and take the responsibility of uh, as a leader, he then becomes a powerful, uh, a powerful hero uh, in the story. All your Marvel stories. They're all about someone who's a reluctant hero. They really don't know who they are. Like Iron Man, he's this arrogant guy at first uh, until he, he realizes who he's supposed to be, so on and so on. Uh, this particular comic book that I'm lifting up here, uh, Bitter Root, good comic book, by the way, um, is the story of a Black family around the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, but this family fights demons. And guess what? These demons uh, infect and possess uh, people and it manifests in racism. So in the comic book, racism is an actual demon. And this black family is assigned specifically to get rid of the demons that cause racism. It's, it's really fun. Uh, fun reading. And then you have an Asian family. Their job is to do the same thing in terms of the certain way that racism plays out for Asian people and those indigenous people. It's really cool how they create this whole universe. But they understand this one simple idea that when you understand and your story, a story can change the world, the right story can change the world. So there's a chapter in the book that talks about this idea of the origin story. And if I may take you to through an origin story of one of the heroes of, of, of American democracy by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. Now I'm a graduate of Morehouse, so you know everybody Morehouse has always been uh, taught to revere and love Dr. King, but I wanna give you his origin story 
just like you got to know the origin story of Superman. He's the only son of Krypton and he's uh, ends up becoming to Earth. And of course, he is adopted by a family and he becomes this hero. The origin story of Batman, uh, that Batman, he's this wealthy guy, but his, his parents are killed when he's young and he decides that he is going to fight uh, against the forces that are destructive, but he never will carry a gun because his parents were killed by a gun. Uh, these origin story, oh, the origin story of Spider-Man, Spider-Man bit by a radioactive spider, uh, but he doesn't do anything with his powers until the death of his uncle. And his uncle tells him with great power comes great responsibility. And he has to understand that you've got to use your powers for good, son. And and so all of these stories are incredibly important. Let me tell you the origin story of another hero. And there are heroes and sheroes all around us all the time. And if we are willing to accept the stories and the story uh, and the larger story that God has given us. So let me tell you the story about Dr. King in a way you've never heard it before. Let us go to Sweet Auburn, Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia. One, an, one of the Black Wall Streets in America. There was not one Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They were all across the South. The places that were controlled and owned and operated uh, by people of African descent. This one space known as Sweet Auburn was a place that was controlled uh, by people of African descent where we didn't just survive, we also flourished. Imagine Dr. King coming out of his house on Auburn Avenue. He comes from a middle-class uh, home and a middle-class house. And every house on one side of the street, one would consider to be middle-class on one side of the street. But across the street, what you would call shotgun homes, the homes of people who were domestics, the homes of people who just delivered coal to people's homes. Those who were the working poor lived across the street, but on one side of the street, doctors, lawyers, and preachers and professors. On the other side of the street, people who were unemployed and domestic workers uh, who were struggling to make ends meet, they all lived in the same community. So one side, middle class, the other side, he saw people who were struggling. Dr. King then turns left. He's walking toward his father's church, Ebenezer Baptist Church. Before he can get to Ebenezer Baptist Church, he passes by the Harbrook's funeral home. The Harbrook's funeral home in the 1930s and 20s and 30s was the only funeral home in Georgia owned and operated by a black man. So here is Dr. King. He sees a model of economic excellence and a woman who is breaking the glass ceiling as he's walking to his father's church. He's already stepped out of his home across the street. He sees the need of those who are in trouble and challenged and marginalized economically. But then when he turns left and begins to walk up uh, a sweet Auburn, Auburn Avenue, he then sees a woman who is breaking the ceiling. But it doesn't stop there. The next building he passes by is W-E-R-D, Word Radio, a Black-owned radio station that is broadcasting uh, people like his father and other ministers, but also is the radio station that is sharing about the great work of people of African descent all across the nation. On that radio station, he heard about A. Philip Randolph. On that radio station, he heard about Pullman Porters. On that radio station, he heard the words of W.E.B. Du Bois on that radio station and how important it was for Black people to organize. On that radio station, he heard someone say, up you mighty race, Marcus Garvey. On that radio station, owned and operated by a black person, by black people, on his way to his father's church, by the way. He passed by a funeral home owned by a sister, passed by a radio station. In other words, black communications, black media owned. But next to the black media station, 
there's a there is a uh there, there is a newspaper the atlanta daily world the only black owned daily newspaper in the united states now many people talk about the chicago defender it was a tremendous paper but it was a weekly the atlanta daily world was published every single day and gave you information on all the lynching throughout the south it had write-ups again uh, by incredible black writers lifted up poetry from the harlem renaissance this is the atlanta daily world he's passed by a funeral home that is black owned a radio station that's black owned then he's passing by a newspaper that's black owned then he also passes by the bethel ame church where bishop henry mcneil turner one time spoke and served. And he stood in that pulpit and said, God is a Negro. He gave black theology before James Cone knew anything about black theology. Is being preached from that pulpit. He's on his way to his father's church, but he's passed by all of this already. Before he even gets to his father's church, he then has to pass by the Atlanta Life Insurance Company started by Alonzo Herndon, who was the first black millionaire in Georgia and one of the first black millionaires in the United States who started off as an enslaved, as an enslaved person, then becomes a barber in Atlanta. But here was his secret. He had two barbershops, one barbershop in the black community, one barbershop in the white community. In the white community, he would just be very quiet and listen to all of the bankers because he put his barbershop specifically in the banking district. You know, why, racism is ignorant and arrogant. They thought that, you know, Mr. Herndon is just cutting the hair. He's too stupid to listen and understand what they're talking about, their derivatives and what they were doing with their money. He, with his memory, at the end of the day, start taking notes what every banker was saying. He says, I'm going to learn what they learned. It was like going to business school. And he started the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. It became one of uh, the most thriving insurance companies in the nation. But he did something different with his insurance company. He said, a portion of the money will be used specifically for Black causes. So for every person you heard about getting jailed, in Georgia, it was the Atlanta Life Insurance Company that always put up the bond secretly. For all the people who traveled to different protests, guess who paid for the buses? The Atlanta Life Insurance Company. That was his job, that was his role. He said, some of us can't be on the front lines. You've got to have some investors in the back that support the movement. And he was the investor that backed the work of the movement. He's on his way to his church, Dr. King. He's on his way to the church now. He ain't got to church yet. He's passed by all this stuff. This is the origin story of Dr. King here. And then he stops by Wheat Street Baptist Church. Oh, I love this portion of the story, y'all. I got to tell you this. Wheat Street Baptist Church was pastored by a person by the name of William Holmes Borders, also a Morehouse graduate. He stood about 6'6", six, six, big man, deep, booming voice who organized with Alonzo Herndon and others in terms of making sure that Black folk would get registered in Atlanta. They were always fighting with the city. Uh, but uh, William Holmes Borders was this powerful preacher. And many of you have heard him, his words and didn't know you were hearing his words. He was also a poet. And he had a poem entitled, I am somebody. I am somebody. I'm a scholar in W.E.B. Du Bois. I am somebody. Uh, I am an institution builder in B Booker T. Washington. I am somebody. I believe in Black people like Marcus Garvey. I am somebody. I am a great a pilot like Bessie Strong who can fly across uh, the United States. I am somebody. I can sing uh, like uh, Lady Day. I am somebody. And guess what? That phrase, I am somebody, was remixed and adapted by somebody named Reverend Jesse Jackson during the period when he set up what was known as Operation Push. He would stand before young people and say, say it with me, I am, I am somebody. That's 
William Ohms Orders. And his poetry can be found in the Library of Congress if you want to have the full piece of his poetry. But not only that, William Holmes Borders did something when Dr. King was, I guess, about 13 or, 14, 13 or 12 or sometime. He played Jesus in the Atlanta Passion Play. Not the Black Passion Play. The Atlanta Passion Play. So the image Dr. King had of Jesus as a child was a six foot six black man with a booming voice by the name of William Holmes Borders, who said, I am somebody. The story is that uh, Dr. King used to sneak up in the balcony of Wheat Street and listen to Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. King would listen to Dr. Borders before he got to his dad's church. And then he made his way almost to his father's church, but he had to go by one other business. And that, <clears throat> Uh, business was the T.M. Alexander Insurance Company. It wasn't as large as the uh, Atlanta Life Insurance, but it was a powerful company. And because of the relationship of Auburn Avenue and Dr. King having the relationship with all these different people, when the Montgomery bus boycott happened, one of the things that the Montgomery City Council did, they passed a law that it was illegal for any Black person who had a car or a truck, or anything else to carry more than the driver because they said you were trying to act like a taxi and you don't have the insurance to be a taxi. So you could not carpool for trying to punish Black people who were walking. So it was the TM Alexander Insurance Company who was contacted who was going to insure the cars in Montgomery. No American insurance company would underwrite cars in Montgomery, Alabama. So T.M. Alexander got on a plane out of uh, Hartsfield Jackson Airport and flew to London and met the Lloyds of London. The Lloyds of London underwrote uh, the insurance. And so Black folk had Uber before Uber knew what Uber was <laughs> in Montgomery. They started picking up Black folk left and right. And when they got pulled over, said, are you trying to be a taxi? He says, the Lloyds of London say I am a taxi driver. They had their stuff together. The beauty of that. And then Dr. King made his way to his father's church. After passing by, and this is what my father says, he says it this way, when you walk by all that somebodiness and then sit in a pew and hear about a man named Jesus, it does something to your spirit. Then he got on a, a streetcar. He had to get in the back of the streetcar, of course, as a child because of segregation. But I like the way my father says it. He says his body was in the back, but his mind was in the front. And he made his way to Morehouse College where he was greeted by his mentor, Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. That's the origin story of Dr. King. Not Boston University, not uh, he studied Niebuhr and studied all of these white theologians, he did, but his root was in the Black community. He had Black empowerment oozing through his pores implicitly because of the way he was raised. That's his origin story. And that's the story we have to begin to tell. That when we look through the window, and the mirror, we wanna make sure we see everything and ourselves. We wanna see the moments where we exclude and the moments that we can improve, the moments of those who've been marginalized, how we can bring them to center. The right story can change your life. If you wanna empower a child, don't tell them they're stupid, Tell them they're brilliant. A teacher who tells you, I believe in you, can change your life. Because what happened? Your story changed. 
a John Thompson at Georgetown told young men, he said, I believe in you. That's why I recruited you because you have great gifts. When we change the story, and all of our young people need, they just need a story change. And that's why we show up at church. That's why we read scripture because the words of Jesus change our stories. There was a time in our life we could look in a window or mirror and we could see everything but ourselves. But when we change the story, we change how we look at the world. And that's what the detractors and those who are, in the words of Samuel DeWitt Proctor, he says, I don't say enemies, I say confused friends. That's what the confused friends are afraid of. I might connect with this new story. And there's power in having the right story. And that's part of learning how to thrive in turbulent times. All right, Doc, that's, that's, that's what I got for tonight. I think I, we kept it at an hour. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Moss. You have enlightened us, oh, just immeasurably with the various stories and how they connect our history. Many of the people we've never heard of before, but played such an important part in that story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Would you like to take some questions for I would. Minute? I would. <laughs> okay. Anyone is free to ask a question right now. Just enter your question in the chat box. <laughs> you Dr. Brendan here uh, from Chicago. Thank you. And we also have the Q and A, huh? Okay. As well. Now, hold on one second. I'm gonna come right back. Just one second. Some okay. At the door. Okay. In the meantime, I'll make the announcement about okay. no class next week. All right. For those of you that are online, know that our fourth session will take place not next week, but the week after. So we'll have one break in between and return on May first at the same time. I hope you have enjoyed these sessions uh, and that you have benefited greatly. I don't see how not because uh, Dr. Moss indeed is a great speaker, a great teacher, a great preacher, and so blessed to have him uh, doing these sessions through our center at the Allen Temple Baptist Church. Know that if you uh, have know of others that have been unable to get on, please spread the word that they can also attend the class through the Allen Temple Baptist Church YouTube channel. And so without, uh, as we wait for Dr. Moss to return, uh, enter in those questions. Take advantage of this moment where you can ask him. All righty, I'm okay. sorry. Looks like a few more Q&A requests are what? in there. We, what do we have here? I say we have one from uh, Michelle. Uh, as an avid reader, I'm concerned about banned books. What should we as people of faith be doing to counter the banning of books especially our books? Oh, wow, that's, that's, this is a wonderful question. Uh, and thank you for that, uh, Sister McGee. I think one of the, the key pieces uh, for us to be involved in 
is involved in our child's education, our children's education, uh, number one, and the curriculum and supporting our libraries. What is happening that has not happened before is people, they've, they've realized, and I say realize they, I'm talking about those forces on the right. Instead of doing things on a federal level, they found an easy entryway is through school boards. You will notice that where the books are being banned are places where there are 90 to 95% white, 95 to 95% white school districts, number one. I'm not saying we don't need to be concerned about that, uh, but they found an easy entryway. The next step is then county and state. So we have to be involved in the policy making on the state, the county, and local level. We have to be involved state, county, local level. And finally, we have to be defenders and supporters of the library system. Let me say it again. We have to be defenders and supporters to ensure that there is no legislation that threatens, removes, harms any librarian simply because there's a book that's there. That's really what's happening now, where they are threatening librarians because they're offering books that they then claim uh, is inappropriate. There's a simple solution to that. If you think something's inappropriate, this is what you do. One, you don't have a child read it, but here's another thing. There is a sheet that schools have always had for years. When I, when I was in school, when y'all were on school, said, I don't want my child to read X, Y, and Z because we as parents don't feel it's appropriate. Well, guess what? then the school gets it and the librarian gets it, but you don't remove a book for everybody. I want my children to read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Just because you don't, that's on you, but don't remove it from the library. Librarians are some of the best advocates for young people learning to read and developing and finding books that are age appropriate for young people. And, and the pathway they are taking is through a fascist way instead of a manner in which that is appropriate and makes allowances for people who may not feel a certain book because of their faith, because of their tradition, because of their culture. That's been happening in America for, for years. There's always been allowances, always been allowances. So we can't have policies that are passed. So great question, Sister McGee. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, Dr. Benita Kitt, uh, is there any way we can continue again this conversation beyond? <laughs> well, we can talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's so very kind. I've been really enjoying this conversation. And I would be delighted. I would be delighted uh, to, uh, to have the conversation. Excuse me. Uh, the next question here is, where would you advise us uh, to, to look to teach ourselves and our children our origin story? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one, I think that every, if you, if every Black household, you should have something called uh, a bookshelf. Uh, with that bookshelf, uh, you should have, if you have small children, you should purchase books that are age appropriate for small children. One of the resources is your library. Another great resource is the Children's Defense Fund for books that are for small children, for children that are in the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, for their development, for high school children. They give you recommendations of, of books that they use in their Freedom School program. Then there are fantastic books of history. Uh, from John Hope Franklin's from, from Slavery to Freedom, from uh, Dr. Vincent Harding's There Is a River There. The 1619 Project collection is amazing. These are great books. And then they have versions that are for young readers. One of the things that I love for young people 
is this new movement of comic books that are like comic book versions of history books that allow young people to have visuals and the information. These things are great. And so there's a lot of that, that available now. It's a great place, great place to start. Wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, how do we reach out to our community uh, that appears to be dismissed? Our traffic children, uh, the homeless uh, within the community. Oh, wonderful question. I think one of the things is that uh, uh, if your church has a ministry that focuses on those who are, are unhoused, there are a variety of ministries in every city. There are a variety of organizations in every city that focused on what you just mentioned, uh, Dr. Kitt, uh, that being those who are trafficked, those who are homeless. To involve yourself in those organizations, partner with those organizations, get on the newsletter for those organizations so you can know about the policies, the movements, things that are happening along those lines is a great uh, place to, to start. All right. Um, it's in fact important that you emphasize that we tell the right story, uh, that you can change the world positively towards the better treatment of black people. How do we continue to be encouraged uh, that uh, our stories are being heard when politically there are factions, people, and movements taking classes to change their stories. The Constitution, all that uh, has happened. That, now, let me see here. The Constitution uh, and the adverse uh, aspects that have been to discourage our efforts and tell our stories. Well, here's the thing. I like the way that my father put it. He said, just because you do good doesn't mean evil's going to sleep. It means that you have to do the work and we're called to, to do the work. It shouldn't, we shouldn't be fearful uh, that people are fighting. It should gird up our strength and our loins. That's what our faith is about, uh, that we are a courageous people. It doesn't mean that we're, we don't have moments where we have fear, don't have fear and anxiety, uh, but courage means you work through that. And there will always be opposition. Uh, there will always be opposition. As a matter of fact, uh, some of the uh, greatest um, fighters thrive in opposition. And, and so opposition just means you must be on the right path. Mm -hmm. So that's all right. It means you must be doing the work. If you got to make that much noise about my history, then there must be something powerful about my history. If you got to do all this work to hide my history, it must be there's something dangerous about my history. So I want to do even more work to explore and expose people to our history. There will always be people who want to keep the status quo, uh, but it should never be a deterrent for us doing the right thing. Uh, Dr. Moss, <laughs> there is a hand raised from Rand and Cheryl and uh, Reverend Charlotte says she can unmute them so that we can- All right, come on, hand them. raised. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Raymond and Raymond, Cheryl. Sure. Hey. Raymond, Cheryl? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Pastor, I simply want to thank you for um, increasing uh, my vocabulary and glossary because mm -hmm. I did not know what these particular times that we are going through uh, is called, the techno-feudalism um, and the uh, consecrated chaos. I uh, truly, truly thank you uh, for that, uh, for giving me that understanding. And the story with Dr. King that I mentioned last week that our children, our Black children, identify uh, Jesus as a Black man to have gone into more detail as to how he came to that realization was absolutely incredible. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is really encouraging. Yeah. We also have another hand raised. They're named Zoom user. <laughs> Zoom user. 
if you would unmute yourself. Yeah, you tell us your name, Zoom user. <laughs> Are you there? We can't seem to hear you. We see you unmuted you know, yourself. Now, look, look at the bottom of your screen. If it says Zoom user, that is you. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Okay. Your question. Hey, Red Mouse. This is Rosie. <laughs> hey, Miss Rosie. <laughs> Rosie works at, is a volunteer for our media ministry. <laughs> I am enjoying it. <laughs> Do you have a specific you have, question, you have a question or Rosie? comment? No, I see him at church Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if we have other questions in the Q&A. Oh, I see we have... Uh... Carla Gilbert Keener has a question. How does TUC's confirmation program and Ubuntu Scholars Initiative link uh, to the issue of origin stories? Great question. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Great question. So one of the things that we do at, at Trinity is, as United Church of Christ, we have confirmation uh, class, which is similar to rites of passage, but we do have a rites of passage program. Confirmation is designed for when children reach about 12 years of age. They go through a period of learning to learn about their faith. We teach them about their faith uh, from an African-centered perspective. And then they publicly share what they've learned before the congregation. Again, it's them learning their origin story. We started a new initiative, really excited about this, and people have been incredibly excited, incredibly generous. We started a program, and we're still in the fundraising process of this, called the Ubuntu Scholars Project. Uh, Ubuntu uh, literally mean that uh, my humanity is tied to uh, your humanity. And the Ubuntu Scholars Project is a study abroad pro program for young people who finish our rites of passage. If they complete our rites of passage program, Trinity will uh, cover the initial costs for them to do study abroad prior to college, where they will study in West Africa, whether it's Senegal, Gambia, Ghana, whatever. They do the cultural tour, learn a little about their history. Second piece is they then have to do service work in that country. Third piece, they have to do study in that country. And we are working through we're early, 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 early conversations with several institutions in Chicago where they will receive credit. So when they arrive on a college campus anywhere in the United States, they will be able to say, oh, yeah, I, I, not only I have credit, but I studied in Senegal. Oh, and by the way, I, I speak French and Fulani. Um, I, I spent six weeks there. We need to have programs that place our students in positions to prosper and to thrive. Instead of waiting for someone else to do it, we wanted to do something that would place their culture, their community, and their faith at the centerpiece. Nothing wrong with any you know, programs that other people do, but we think that they need to have a program let me put it this way. We want to have a Wakanda style program uh, <laughs> so that uh, Wakanda is centralized and central for their growth and for their development. I think she had a second part to that question, is the model. Oh, oh the model. Yes, yeah, you it certainly uh, can replicate the model. We will be sharing with anyone who would like to, you know, have information about both of those uh, programs. We've had the confirmation class for quite some time. We could share that uh, curriculum with anyone. And we are in, you know, like I said, the early stages of the Ubuntu Scholars Program. And I'm glad you raised that question because we do need to make sure that we are documenting everything in terms of 
something that's can be shared and more of a book form or pamphlet or um, a presentation form, because our hope is other churches will do the same thing. And this, this is a long dream, but you know, then you got the Ubuntu scholars in at Allen Temple, whatever name you choose, and uh, some at uh, uh, Concord Church in New York, and some at Ebenezer, and you got all these scholars all over the place. And can you imagine? You know, you got two, three hundred students in West Africa studying, and they building relationships early on before they go to college, and then they go to college, and they all have this this common program that they were a part of that's how we we build leaders for a new generation and that would be absolutely extraordinary if you know 20 30 years down the road uh, there are you know three or four hundred graduates of the scholars program from across the country and they are in positions of influence to transform uh, the democratic project in america And I believe the last question uh, has to do as to when the class will end. So, yes, we will not have class uh, next week. We will have completed three weeks. And so our fourth and last session will be on Wednesday, May 1st. It looks like we have no other questions. I think that covers it. Yeah. Yeah, we appreciate oh, I, you so much. I appreciate. I gotta. I gotta give you the. I said I promised I would make the book recommendation, so I'm gonna give you the books real quick for everybody. Okay. All right. Um, that first one was Helium. I said these, these are po these are poetry books. These are all poetry books. Okay. You'll enjoy that Helium by Rudy Francesco. Great book. All right. I got. It. These are poetry books for people who probably don't like poetry, but you're going to fall in love with poetry about after reading these things uh, <laughs> to help people. Black Oaks by uh, Harold Green III. So he does this, these poems of different uh, black men across the country. Uh, I have to have to mention I was blown away that he was kind enough. Oh, no, wait a minute. Let me let me find this one in here. To put a poem in here. Or a brother named uh, Otis Moss, and he has they have pictures of of each particular person he's writing a poem about. Uh, it's a pretty good book. Lo local poet, he's really great. If you poetry unbound, fifty poems to open your world is actually part of a podcast. It's like one of my favorite. It's a, it's a collection from around the world, uh, and the person who is the author, Patrick Otuma, he's a theologian, and he. Talk, these poems are almost like prayers. They're they're really phenomenal. That's this, poetry. What's, what was the name of that one again? Poetry Unbound. Okay. Poetry Unbound. Poetry Unbound. Okay. This is a standard one. This is just great. African-American poetry, 250 years of struggle and uh, song uh, edited by Kevin Young. This is the... Uh, Library of America. This this gives you everything from uh, the 18th century all the way to today. Uh, African American poetry, amazing. Uh, this one right here. This young lady is probably one of the baddest writers out today. Her name is Cole Arthur Riley. Mm -hmm. She is a theologian, a poet, a writer of of just amazing prayers. She is the modern day version of Howard Thurman. Seriously, I'm not making that up at all uh, for the for the Gen Z and Gen X generation. It will completely give you hope in reference to what young people, younger a younger generation is doing. And you can also use a lot of these uh, prayers in church and whatnot. It's really pretty amazing. And if you're looking for another great collection of poetry, uh, this one right here, This is the Honey by Kwame Alexander, uh, an anthology of contemporary Black poets. These are all of the new generation of poets. Amazing stuff. Absolutely amazing people, uh, persons of poetry. The first poem in this book is by Nikki Giovanni. 
which is an extraordinary poem called We're Going to Mars. <laughs> you have to read it. It's absolutely amazing of what Nikki Giovanni does. But Kwame Alexander also writes great pieces for young adults. So if you're looking for something, you have a young person who is 13, 14, 15, uh, maybe you know, in around that age, who said, ah, I'm not quite sure, I don't like reading. He has a book of poetry for young men who don't like to read, young boys, called The Crossover. And it's written almost like hip hop about a young man attempting to get on a basketball team. It's a, it's a book, uh, but it's written in like hip hop, rap, poetic verse. It's brilliant. And I bought it for my son when he was small. He loved it uh, and uh, really, really appreciate it. So those are my recommendations uh, for, for today, for poetry, for people who may not like poetry, but hopefully you'll fall in love with poetry. Okay, if nothing else, we'll say good night. And we'll see you once again on May 1st, same time. God bless. Take care. God bless. Mm -hmm.